each fall, hundreds of thousands of migrating crows join local flocks to create one of the biggest roost sites in the world. Crows like what humans did to North America. They liked it a lot. And they like what we like. We like open spaces with trees, and that's what they like. So we cut down all the forests in the east, made them open up, still a few trees for, for nesting and all that. They like that. And now they're everywhere. Crows are always watching, learning, and remembering. They're especially attentive on garbage day. Crows memorize the garbage truck routes, learning when the best time is to scavenge some succulent treats. So we're omnivores and we're social. And crows are omnivores. And sometimes we don't like the animals that have the same qualities as us. We don't like crows because crows are opportunistic. And oh, so are humans, though. <laughs> crows are invasive. Crows will um, do all sorts of things that humans do that we are not particularly proud of doing, like feeding on garbage. That long cultural interaction we've had with crows in a negative way has seeped into our modern culture. Whenever something bad is going to happen on a movie, you hear a crow call in the distance. The mayor of Chatham tried to rid the city of their crow infestation by introducing a shooting competition. But as soon as one crow was shot, the word went out, and they all learned just how high to fly to stay out of the range of the pellets. That's when the city turned to Ulrich Waterman and his hawk Harriet to try to drive the crows out of town. The crows, being highly intelligent, they can figure out a human being. They can figure out a raptor, but that the two work together, that's too much for them. They cannot comprehend that their two worst enemies are working together, that, that freaks them out. Oh yeah, she wants to go. Let another one go. <laughs> uh, the reason that I let that crow go is she was not much harmed and is in, in good shape to join her uh, friends there. And she will tell the story of what just happened to her. See them all, they're all coming up now and she's joining them now and uh, telling them the horrible story. Crows learn from each other's misfortunes. When one is killed in a farmer's field, it's not uncommon for them to change entire migratory patterns so that no crows fly over that field for as long as two years. There's no doubt about it. Crows talk. Professor John Marsluff knows that crows talk, and that is at the heart of his groundbreaking new study. See that nest up there? He wants to find out if crows have the ability to pass information on, not just from one adult to another, but from one generation to the next. To study this, he's going to follow several crows from hatching through their first year to see how they learn. It won't be easy. Less than 50% of crows survive their first year. Right now, all we know is that there's eggs up there and it's really a gamble whether those eggs are gonna turn into young birds that we are then able to follow when they leave the nest and encounter new things in their environment. Before the eggs were laid, Marsloff and his team caught and banded adult crows in five different test locations around Seattle. They wore a different mask at each location. 
Now, a handful of crows at each of those test sites, including our crow parents, has learned that one specific mask means danger. What Marsloff wants to find out is whether the parents will pass on their knowledge of the dangerous face to their young. And will the young not just learn to recognize this face, but remember and use this information months from now when their parents aren't around? Surprisingly, this kind of learning in the wild has only been proven with primates. We're trying to see the fledglings in this nest. When the team stands in the park without their masks on, the crow's response appears to be quite normal. So those are just regular caws uh, communicating, certainly some excitement, but not a scolding vocalization. Now, as part of the experiment, he puts on the mask, and it's a whole different story. We're in a critical part of the study right now because the young are just to the point where they're learning everything that they're going to need to survive for this next year or two. And we want them to learn as part of this process that some people are bad, in particular our face with the mask on it is bad. We have to show that a, a trait is observed, not directly experienced by an individual, which is what we're doing with these young birds as they see their parents scold the mask. Then we have to see if they have learned from their parent to respond, and do they take that learning and that memory with them as they establish in a new place. That's really a hallmark of intelligence that is seen in very, very few animals. It's the sort of thing that is required for culture to evolve. If Marsluff is able to show that each generation of crows is capable of building on an earlier generation's knowledge, then he will prove that crows possess a kind of evolutionary advantage shared by only a handful of the world's smartest creatures. How'd you score that one, Dave? Beautiful. They stayed like, back there <laughs> swarming on me while, <laughs> while we were even waiting. Awesome, that was... Yeah. Uh, it was like, it was like, yeah, I was just like, that, that was beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. While Marsluff and his team are watching the crows, someone else is watching them. The U.S. Department of Defense is funding their study because they think the crow's ability to recognize faces and point out the bad guys might have applications beyond the bird world. For millennia, humans have looked upon crows as highly intelligent creatures, the wise guy, the trickster. Only recently have crows become a focus of major scientific scrutiny around the world. Scientists want to know why crows, who don't have the biggest of all the bird brains, are proving to be the most intelligent of all the birds. Crows do not have the biggest brains of all birds. Parrots do. But it's crows that are by far the top among birds, whether it's the American crow, the European species, the North American species. Every continent of the world has its crow, its member of the genus Corvus, that's at the top of the rankings for that particular area of the world. The idea that crow intelligence was worth studying came from a tiny French island 700 kilometers off the coast of New Zealand that's home to arguably the smartest crow species in the world. In 1993, scientists from the University of Auckland discovered that New Caledonian crows had an ability long thought to be the domain of humans and great apes, the ability to use tools. It's a bit of a puzzle. Why is it that it really is just this one species of New Caledonian crow stuck on a relatively small island in the Pacific that uses these really complex tools? Russell Gray is part of the team that made that first astonishing discovery 
and he continues to return to the island to study these remarkable birds. Alex Taylor has spent the last two years on the island living with the crows and conducting experiments. In terms of biodiversity, it's on the kind of top 10 hotspots for the world. There's just so much stuff here that just doesn't live anywhere else. And especially with the insects and plants, there's tons that's not even been documented. So it's kind of a really special place. What's truly remarkable is that New Caledonian crows don't just use tools, they make them as well. It was really amazing to see that they'd go through this long, complex sequences of actions. It wasn't just like one step, like rip off a stick, and it wasn't even two steps. It was breaking off at a difficult place of the branch below a fork, trimming off the side branches, and then crafting away at, at, at the base of the fork to get a really functional uh, hook tool. Uh, and that was really amazing to see an animal uh, knowing there's some food there, putting all this effort into getting its tool just right for the job. There's really three species that make tools. Elephants, chimpanzees, and the Caledonian crows. So just three out of like, you know, six million or whatever that's on the planet. People went wild when Jane Goodall found that chimps could actually use tools at all. And the chimpanzees have never been found to use hooks in any kind of way. So to find um, a crow species that's doing, using tool use in a, and making tools in a much more sophisticated way than the chimps, really, I think, uh, it hit everyone's radars. Sometimes you see really complex things, but there's some simple trick to it, some lower level behavior that underlies it. Well, any behavior you see like that in the wild makes you think. It makes you think, I really need to do an experiment. First we put the uh, meat into the hole, then we put the long stick in the toolbox, right at the back, out of reach of the crow, and we put a short tool uh, in front of the box, it's one thing to use a tool to get food, but to use a tool to get another tool to get food requires much more complex cognitive powers. This meta-tool use, as it's called, is considered to be crucial in the evolution of humans. Well, the thing that sparked technical evolution in humans was when we started using uh, rocks not to crack nuts or bones or other bits of food, but um, use them to crack other rocks. So it's really interesting to find that a crow species can actually do this mental use, cool. because then we start having some kind of idea of the kind of cognitive abilities that um, you know, our early ancestors uh, might have had. Just how smart are these crows? In an experiment that has never been tried before, this crow will be challenged to push its abilities to the next level. And we're looking to see if the crow can act out a three-step plan, like think like three chess moves into the future, and pull up the string to get the short tool, take the short tool to get the long tool, and then take the long tool to get the food. Oh, this should be really, I'm really fascinated by this. Um, I'm really, uh, um, I really want to see if they're able to do it because um, I hope they can, but um, they may just, it may just be, uh, too, be like too long a distance between their first action with the string and the time they gain the food, so they're going to kind of forget what they're doing once they're up and uh, string pulling. So, yeah, I'm really curious to see how this is going to go. This is the first time this experiment has ever been attempted, and our cameras are there to record what happens.
Crows have done amazingly well and really surprisingly well. We didn't expect them to be this good at these kind of problems. They've performed at the highest levels with tasks requiring technical intelligence out of pretty much any animal on the planet. Crows are very intelligent for animals. Their brain size relative to their body size is of the same caliber as many primates. So it really is appropriate to think of these animals as feathered apes. Back in Seattle, John Marsloff's test crows, who hatched two weeks ago, are growing up fast. Marsluff checks the nests daily. One nest catches his eye because it's home to a baby crow unlike all the other nestlings. With a distinct band of white on her wings, she's immediately given the name White Wing. Their ever attentive parents are kept busy feeding them. But they're not the only ones. Some pairs of crows have what we call helpers at the nest. Those might be a young male or perhaps a female that, re that remains in the natal territory for a year or two, and they help their, their siblings. Having so many family members providing food and protection allows the baby birds to concentrate on growing and learning. And this, scientists believe, leads to an acceleration in brain development. Crows have very interesting social systems, and it's actually probably more like Western human civilization than any other animal on the planet. Right? There are no primates that have what we have in Western civilization, which is essentially a mated pair, right? monogamous male and female, more or less, um, with their kids, offspring from a bunch of years, and an extended families where you know your relatives and all that. The basic social unit is the family. The whole family spends hours standing guard in nearby trees and keeping an eye out for predators who might want to harm their defenseless young. At three weeks old, the baby crows are almost ready to leave their nests. Kind of a tight spot here. Now it's the time in the experiment to put leg bands and radio tags on them. The team is ready on the ground to catch any crows who might decide to make a break for it. All right, Dave, get ready. Okay. Get ready, Heather. There he goes, Dave, right at you. We got him. I'm coming down. Those are so calm. They are. Probably the best way to understand the development of intelligence is to follow a young bird as it's gathering its intelligence. How's your climb, John? <sighs> Either the trees are getting taller or I'm getting older, <laughs> or a little of both. Really, without a radio tag where you can reliably every day find that individual, see what it's doing compared to what it did yesterday, understand its experiences for an accumulating life. Without that, you really can't understand this development of cognition. They banned eight birds from five different nests. There he goes. There you got him, good job. That one's out, the white wings, that's awesome. Oh, wow. White wing, welcome to science. All right, we need to get these kids back to their family. These young birds are about to experience a lot of new things in a relatively short period of time. Crows have shown a great ability to adapt to change in some unusual ways. As Tokyo has grown into the world's largest city, humans and crows are thrust closer and closer together. 
it's not been an easy accommodation for humans. Crows and humans are at war with one another. The crow's resourcefulness comes from their intelligence. Their adaptability is their strength. A Japanese species of crow known as jungle crows is one of nature's best construction workers. Inventive scavengers, these jungle crows are constantly on the lookout for new building materials for their nests. In Japan, where laundry is done almost daily, it's a common sight to find clothes drying outdoors on metal hangers. For crows, this is an opportunity far too tempting to pass up. For crows, there is an ideal sickness for nesting material. This is too thin for their beaks. This is too thick. This is a perfect thickness. It is exactly the thickness of a wire hanger. Jungle crows shape their nests to fit the female's body. The crow manipulates the hangers to create her own made-to-measure nest. Using hangers as nesting material might be a clever adaptation to life in an urban jungle, but when the crows opt to locate their nests in some place other than a tree, it can lead to shocking consequences. Nests intertwined with metal hangers have stopped high-speed trains in their tracks and caused blackouts in entire neighborhoods. So the Japanese have come up with their own clever response. Preventing power interruptions is a couple's first priority. Number one. The Crow Patrol of the Kyushu Electric Power Company fans out with a single mission. To find and destroy the homes of destructive squatters. They outsmart us humans. We remove their nests as we find them. But they see this and circle above, waiting to build a new one. It's tough to outwit crows. When we work hard to develop a strategy against them, crows develop counter strategies to foil it. All we can do is to look for new methods based on our experiences, apply them, and deal with the outcome. That's the only way we can manage. I think the crows are as smart as we are, so we feel challenged. We think we have to fight against them. We are competing with the crows, these smart birds, as our intellectual equals in this fight. Not long after Marsluff and his team have returned the newly banded test babies to their nest, they're ready to head out on their own. Young crows don't leave the nest because they know how to fly. 
They leave because it's too dangerous to stay. Life on the ground is only marginally safer. The most important lesson a young crow learns is when to move and when to stay still. Verbal signals could mean the difference between life and death. Crows have different warning calls. One for cats, and one for hawks, and another for humans. Scientists have identified over 250 distinct crow calls. In addition, each crow has an individual voice with at least two different dialects. One loud version for the general crow community, and a separate quiet dialect for talk just within the family. These types of sophisticated language skills are found only among the most intelligent of species. White Wing and her brother have managed to survive their first month. They might look fully grown, but they're at the equivalent stage of a toddler. Their blue eyes have yet to turn black, and their beaks have the telltale red skin of a young crow. They're at the very beginning of learning what it takes to be a crow. Nobody's really studied the acquisition or the learning process at this initial stage out of the nest, but it's gotta be phenomenal. They're encountering all sorts of things at that time, new foods, new dangers. They're learning all about their world in a very short, hectic time when they are not very coordinated, so they're also learning how to hold themselves and move through this three-dimensional world. Even once White Wing is mobile, she continues to beg and rely on her family for food. Crows can spend up to five years with their parents, the longest natal period amongst bird species. Like humans, the proper nurturing and education of their young takes time and gives youngsters more time to observe and learn. This luxury of time is a huge contributing factor to a crow's cognitive development. The family provides for almost every need, food, grooming, and perhaps even affection. By the time White Wing is three months old, she's starting to really test her wings. And yet, she still clings to her mother's side. Crows seem to need to be close to each other, especially their parents. By the time White Wing is four months old, she's starting to find food on her own. She, like all crows, quickly develops an appetite for a wide variety of foods. And this kind of diverse diet has a direct impact on brain development. A lifestyle that's more complicated because you're eating a wider diversity of foods is something that explains part of the intelligence of some primates and also part of the intelligence of some birds. So it's the same principle, the fact that you're an omnivore that seems to be pushing the brain towards having bigger areas to cope with the extra amount of information. If an animal only eats fruit, then it only has to learn about one food group. Crows eat fruits, vegetables, and meat, so they have to be able to identify and learn how to work with all these foods. 
Walnuts, for example, are a bit of a challenge. But crows have figured out not just how to get the husk off them, they've mastered the art of how to crack a tough nut. As they fly, they gauge the weight of each nut and drop it from just the right height to have it crack but not shatter as it hits the pavement. Then they follow the nut down to make sure no one steals it. They've even refined this remarkable talent further. They make sure that the walnuts hit the road just when the traffic signals turn red, eliminating the risk that either they or their walnuts fall victim to the passing traffic. White Wing is starting to master some of the skills of being an omnivore. Clearly, it's a big learning curve. Our test crow's worlds are expanding. White Wing is leaving the safety of her parents to go off and play with others. Like a teenager, she's eager to seek adventure with friends, but reassured that come evening, she can return to the safety of family. Social animals are typically some of the most intelligent animals, and it makes sense. Being social has a lot of demands on you that require your ability to learn and remember things. You have to learn and remember the relation of the other to yourself. Plus, uh, it would be very good if you also learn and remember or even infer the relations among others, that exist among others. So the more the group is structured by different types of relationship, the more brain power you need to calculate all those different type of interactions. Scientists at the Konrad Lorenz Institute in the Austrian Alps have for more than half a century studied the social behavior of a variety of birds. Now they're turning their attention to crows. Anna Braun is working on an experiment to test crows' reasoning abilities. This kind of test has been used on children, apes, and dogs. These are the first trials to be conducted on crows. This is a touch screen which we are just starting to work with the carrying crows. And here you see a two-choice procedure in which the birds get the option between two different icons. One is positively rewarded and one negatively rewarded. The watch bucket. They learn through experience. They just peg on it, on one they get food, and on the other they don't, they get a red screen. So this is the right one in this case. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> and then a picture combination appears on the screen with an image the crow has never seen before. It now has to infer which image will bring the reward. When this task was presented to children, they mastered it after just a few tries. Dogs took as many as 70 attempts to solve the puzzle. Crows surprisingly figured out this experiment almost as quickly as children. But they already come very far, and that's the, that's the big surprise for all of us. They come from a behavioral point in the, in the cognitive tasks. They come on the level that is reached by some ape species, and which is quite surprising. Thomas Bunyar has previously worked with apes, his current interest in crows is focused on something psychologists call theory of mind, a creature's ability to recognize that other creatures might have differing ideas from their own. Theory of mind is a huge step of not only thinking about you, you, yourself, what you yourself know, what you yourself feel, what you yourself experience, but also just to extrapolate and think about others as being their own creatures with their own kind of mental life.
crows clearly demonstrate this kind of agile thinking when it comes to storing their food. First, they hide it. Scientists call this food caching. When they cache, they're on the lookout for any clues that another crow might be spying on them. Over there, this individual over there, he just did a food cache very close to the others. But then he recovered it again and moved up the hill and now he's caching again. He left the cache site and now he's sitting over there as private as he could be watching, paying attention to what's going to happen with the bird who approached. If they suspect they've been seen, crows will move their cache, defend it, or they may even fake cache, keep food in their pouch and only pretend to bury it. These are all highly complex cognitive behaviors. So a kind of cognitive arms race is starting between those that try to prevent pilfering and prevent the others from watching and those that have to watch for pilfering. And we are talking now not only about behaviors, but we are talking also about the mental state. At five months, White Wing is reaching the end of her adolescence. She appears to have an understanding of caching, and she's venturing further and further from home and testing her wings. One behavior that intelligent animals appear to all share is play. Play allows the mind to learn unexpected things, and young crows love to play. These flights of fancy are more than just fun-seeking, though. White Wing and her pals are building up strength with these cannonball rolls, and these loop-de-loops are the perfect way to evade a hawk in hot pursuit. They also provide a pretty good way to impress a mate. Attracting a mate is perhaps the most important event in White Wing's life, because crows mate for life, a life that might last as long as 20 years. It looks as though White Wing has found herself a promising candidate. Marsluff is having trouble finding one of his young crows at another of the test sites. Wow, we're getting closer. So it's still not that close. I got the gain up fairly high. Yeah, this doesn't look good to me. Uh-oh. It looks like the sort of place somebody would come to eat somebody. Oh, there's the culprit. Oh. Cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawk? Yeah. Oh, laughing, there, there it nest. is, right there. Yep, there's, there's a nest, a nest. right there. Looking. Yeah, they could be eating that crow right now. Hope it chokes on it. With this young test crow dead, only three crows remain in the study. He knew from the start it wasn't going to be easy to follow young crows for a year. And it's not just the young who perish. One of the parents was found shot not far from the nest. Death is not insignificant in the crow world. People have witnessed a mysterious scene that they can only describe as a crow funeral, where crows gather together en masse to mark the site where one of their own has died. They sit silently for a few minutes, and then they take off without a sound. Eerie is how it's been described. Animals seem to feel pain. Uh, social animals seem to feel social pain. They seem to grieve for a while when, when their partners die. Um, and that's not surprising. You know, that's evolutionary, the same tools, same evolutionary tools working for people as it is for animals. Few crows make it out of adolescence, and unfortunately, that was the case for White Wing. 
When she was six months old, she was hit by a car not far from home. With White Wing dead, there's only one crow left in Marsloff's experiment. The success or failure of the experiment now hinges on a single crow. But first, he has to find his subject, who's disappeared somewhere in Seattle's urban jungle. This bird is extremely difficult to find. It's in an area that has lots of places it can hide from a ground walking person. If we could fly, it'd be a lot easier here. But this bird is all over the place. It's expanding its range. It could be anywhere in here. And it moves very quickly out of our sight and out of our telemetry range. Yeah, it's needle and haystack. We have a little better um, line on the bird because we have a radio on it, but it's, it's an awful lot of luck. We had a signal coming up this way, you know, I don't know, it could be anywhere in here. I got nothing here. Let's try it this way. You guys hear birds at all? Nope. I'm hearing my dreams now. Nothing. These observations are extremely difficult and rare to get where we have the bird in a place where we can see it. This is the only one of the uh, seven or eight that we had tagged that, are, that was exposed to a mask with its parents that is now still alive. And so what, we are, what we're hoping to see is um, a clear response to us with that mask. And we're still hoping this bird will do what we expect, but it, it may not. Stronger over here. Let's just see from this corner where we get it. That's that's exciting. It's a million dollar crow. Why? Well, we've just put a lot of effort into finding him. Oh, today. okay. Well, I'm glad you found him. Yeah. It. Looks great. The antenna looks good. Well, there, he just flew now. He's perched right there. I think if we walked from here, it'd be pretty good. The final stage of Marsloff's experiment begins. As he walks back and forth within sight of the last crow, the subject's reaction is one of benign indifference. I'll go back by with the mask on and see if we can see any difference. As he was growing up, this young crow repeatedly saw his parents scold researchers wearing a particular mask. Now Marsloff puts that same mask on. He's not expecting the same reaction he got with the crow's parents. This is a young bird, naive and inexperienced, and trying to learn to cope on his own. If he makes any call at all, it would be significant but Marsloff's fear is he might just fly away. For a moment, it seems like he's done just that, but then the bird takes another perch higher up, keeping a close eye on Marsloff and his mask. And then, there it is. To many, just the tentative scold of one young crow. But to John Marsloff, it's a major milestone. That was pretty exciting. Well, that was a, you'll never get a better exposure than that, I don't think. That's, that was clean. To me, what it indicates is that that bird clearly recognized his face which the only way it could have learned about this face as being anything unique was from its parents' behavior. So I think that shows the first step of social learning. There he's really looking down at me, yeah. There he's scolding. This is the first scientific evidence that crows are able to learn, remember, and put to use information gained months earlier from their parents. 
This is a huge evolutionary advantage that until now has only been proven in a rarefied group of the smartest creatures on Earth. This year has been really full of discoveries, I would say, for us. We've learned that crows are able to recognize and distinguish many different people and remember the deeds we've done to them, be they good or bad, for a long period of time. And now we're learning something about how they share information with their young, which has been something that we really haven't understood at all. And with this radio tag crow that we've been following coming to the roost here tonight, that bird has taught us a tremendous amount that indeed just hanging out with your parents, a young crow soaks up a lot of information and they learn that very rapidly. I feel great that this bird has survived long enough to join the full community of crows. It's not surprising that animals have some of the same abilities as us because we're built from the same building blocks. And we as people, we tend to think that, oh, well, only people do this. Right. Well, we haven't found anything like that yet. We may be unique in having the whole cluster of things that we can do, but what we're gonna find out is that other animals out there can do some of that. And if we figure out the way to ask the questions, we might be surprised at the responses we get. Crows share a lifestyle with us. If we can understand the link between that lifestyle and the evolution of intelligence and the evolution of brains, we've advanced in our understanding of brains, intelligence in general, which includes us. Crows have been watching us for a very, very long time. Only recently have scientists begun to watch back. And what they're finding is a creature that's far more complex, more intelligent, and more like us than we could have ever imagined.